Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2014 edition of the Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. Today the Royal Tyrol Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Dr. Julius Chotoni. Julius is probably best known as a paleo artist whose art can be seen in many museums around the world, including here at the Royal Tyrol Museum. But what most people don't know is that he is also a microbiologist by training. Julius was born in Hungary but grew up in Edmonton, Alberta. He obtained his bachelor's degree in ecology and environmental biology and a master's degree in ecology, both from the University of Alberta. For his thesis, Julius studies facil facilitation of a growth of ceratodon moss by elk trampling in the marginal environments at the edge of sand dunes near Jasper Lake. During that time, Julius became increasingly interested in astrobiology, that is, the possibility of life on other planets, so he decided to move to Winnipeg to study, study his PhD, uh, pursue his PhD in microbiology at the University of Manitoba. For his dissertation, he studied extremophile bacteria that live in, at deep ocean hydrothermal vents and in terrestrial hypersaline springs. The fieldwork for the hydrothermal vents proved especially exciting and unusual as it involved the collection of samples by remotely operated submersibles on the, sun, on the Juan de Fuca and Explorer ridges in the Pacific Ocean. It is during his PhD years that Julius began freelancing as a paleo artist, drawing, drawing illustrations of dinosaurs and other extinct animals for various museums. Some of his first contracts were with the Royal Tyrrell Museum, for which he drew illustrations used in the Ceratopsian exhibit and the Alberta Interpretive Fossil Trail. Soon after, World of Julius's talent spread and his career as a petty artist took off and he never looked back. Over the years, Julius's illustrations have been used in museums and traveling exhibits around the world, as well as in numerous media release releases accompanying scientific discoveries. Some of Julius's artwork will be featured here at the Royal Tyrol Museum in a new photographic exhibit scheduled to open this summer. And finally, but not least, a book dedicated to Julius's artwork, including both old and never before seen illustrations, will be published in May and will be available in all bookstores. Today, Julius will present an overview of his research on extremophile bacteria and its implication for the origi origin and evolution of life. So, without further delay, I present you Dr. Julius Chotoni. Thanks, Bertha. All right. Okay, good morning. Uh, can everybody hear me there? Yeah. See? Okay, good. No, I can't hide. All right, so um, thank you very much for coming out. And um, yeah, so. We're, I'm going to be talking about a whole kind of a different area than what I normally do. Um, I guess from one of our, some of our favorite uh, movies about dinosaurs, we all kind of know that uh, life um, finds a way if eventually if it uh, has enough time and enough, unfortunate tourists to feed on. Uh, but I'm going to step back and kind of talk about life way back, much, much before the dinosaurs here, and talk about some of how some of my research and other research around the world on some of these weird bacteria and other kinds of life forms out there have implications for some of how life may have originated and, and evolved on Earth. Okay, so actually this here is a, oops, there we go. This is a, a photograph of one of these weird environments, these extreme environments in Yellowstone National Park. This is Grand Prismatic Spring, and it's, it's a really hot environment. It's one of the strange places. So as Francois was saying, most of what I do nowadays, my day job is basically a scientific illustrator, and I work with uh, scientists around the world, uh, reconstructing visually what hopefully we think animals and plants and prehistoric environments look like. Uh, and a good example here is there's a, a wonderful set of specimens of an ornithomimus uh, that Francois and Darla Zelenitsky and their colleagues actually discovered right here in Alberta. And uh, it, was, it represents the first known non-avian or non-bird dinosaur with uh, feather impressions from the Western Hemisphere. So a big discovery, and I was honored enough to be able to work with them to make a reconstruction of it. That's most of what I do, but we're going to look at something a lot farther back and see what not only the fossil evidence tells us about what life may have been like far before the dinosaurs, but other things as well, such as uh, the, the way in which uh, organisms are made up biochemically and what that says about where they came from. So again, when I say how did life first find a way or, or first gain a foothold, 
I want to put into perspective kind of what kind of time scales we're looking at here. So this is sort of a graphic showing the age of Earth starting from about four and a half billion years ago, kind of like a clock up to today. And the dinosaurs lived in this little stretch of time here, about 230 or 40 million years ago up to today. But life has been around since nearly four billion years on Earth, which is about 85% of life of, of Earth's history. It's been around for a long time. And I'm not talking about in this talk just about where it began, but how it also evolved throughout it. So we're kind of looking at the time from around the beginning there to close to the time when cells started getting together and, and, and differentiating and making multicellular organisms like us. One of the things that we're going to see repeatedly as a theme here is that throughout Earth's history, and you see many examples of it today, life exists in environments that would kill you and I really hostile by our standards. These we call extreme environments for obvious reasons, but also because they are sometimes right at the edge of what life systems can actually tolerate. You know, like up to maybe 150 degrees Celsius where biomolecules start falling apart and life is physically impossible. But life finds a way to exist in some of these really strange environments like your Mammoth Hot Springs and Yellowstone National Park. The temperature is near boiling in many cases. Um, or in, there's other examples of extreme environments that harbor these life forms, such as the Rio Tinto River, uh, which has a pH of about 2.2, which is not too far off from stomach acid. And the, the red color here is uh, due largely to the iron uh, that results from microbial activity uh, in, in that state. Uh, you also have environments that are super salty, hypersaline environments that, that approach saturation and in some cases right, right at saturation for salt. And microorganisms still live there right up to saturation, sometimes living inside of salt crystals and little inclusions inside. Okay, so these strange organisms are either extremely tolerant, which is what we call them if they tolerate these conditions but prefer to live at more moderate uh, conditions, or extremophiles, which require these crazy conditions by our standards to survive. They have special adaptations to reinforce their uh, cellular machinery so that if you brought them into our conditions they would die or stop growing because they're specifically adapted to those conditions. So a lot of these environments are kind of like relics of what we found on earlier times in Earth history and it suggests that extremophiles have been around and maybe dominated a lot of Earth's history for a long time. So let's start at the beginning and go through a bit of a, I'm going to organize this sort of as a little bit of a tour through evolution of some of the major highlights, just to kind of what I think is interesting anyway along the way. But to begin, we need to define what we mean by life in the first place, right? I mean, most of us kind of have a good idea of what life is like, but when we're talking about the origin of life, we really have to break it down. And so life's definition is basically kind of a working definition. And as we'll see, it's not, it's not a one or zero, it's not like there is a very natural definition of life and then it's easily separated from non-life. In some cases, there's things that are sort of halfway in between. It's kind of a gradient, best thought of. But it has certain characteristics that life forms that we all generally agree on share. It tends to respond to its environment uh, and it does that in order to be able to, for example, consume certain resources, bring some materials into the cell and use them to gain energy from them uh, in order to be able to grow. Uh, growing is one of the, the components of life, or one of the characteristics rather, uh, in order to replicate or to reproduce, to make more copies of itself. And it does that by partially by encoding some information and in storage, uh, information storage molecules that it can use as blueprints. Uh, and this allows it to, as all life, be able to undergo natural selection and evolution into different forms that are ultimately better and better suited to the environment in which they live. Okay, so these definitional components are kind of, um, they depend on the level of complexity we're looking at. They're, they're easier to include all in a life form that is very complex, but in really simple ones or really early ones, some of these features were just getting developed. And there are other things like fire or crystals that have some of these parts of the definition, but not all of them. It's kind of a complex way of looking at things, but it also shows that life began kind of gradually. 
okay, and built up from, uh, from chemistry, basically. It's a complex set of chemical reactions that's been going on for four billion years and becoming ever more complex. So the early Earth was pretty hostile as well by our standards. It began about four and a half billion years ago. Uh, in the beginning, there was a lot of bombardment by large meteorites or asteroids, sometimes vaporizing the early oceans before they settled back in. Lots of volcanic activity, uh, both on land and in the ocean, uh, where you have water that seeps into the crust and is spewing out really hot water as it nears the magma, hydrothermal vent systems. The atmosphere was not like today. There was basically no oxygen trace amounts. There's a lot of water, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, which smells like rotten eggs, basically. Uh, some nitrogen and methane, uh, free hydrogen, stuff that isn't around very much today, be partly because of the oxygen in our atmosphere, as I'll explain as well later. There was an ocean and some early continents, as some of the recent research on, on uh, zircons uh, is showing from 4.4 billion years ago, it looks like there were oceans. But again, lots of volcanism, hostile place by our standards, and this is where life got started. But what's, and, and this is a good example of a modern environment, sort of a schematic, uh, that is similar to some of the environments that existed there. I had the privilege of working uh, during my PhD research on several deep ocean cruises where we sent down remote operated submersible uh, on the Wanda Fuca Ridge and the Explorer Ridges down to one to two kilometers depth about, and there are these areas where uh, there's magma near the surface uh, uh, underneath the, the crust, and water seeps in through the rocks, through cracks, and as it nears the magma, it gets superheated uh, to hundreds of degrees Celsius, and it, it basically blasts up to the surface through fissures. When it hits the top, all of these metals and sulfides that it dissolved on the way up because it's hotter, and more acidic, uh, suddenly hit the cold water and precipitate out, and what looks like smoke billows out of these uh, chimney-like structures that grow at, through accumulation of these minerals. And it, the water coming out is full of uh, toxic metals, uh, all sorts of interesting kinds of compounds. And right now, because of the ocean is full of oxygen, you, you have different things forming than they would have in the past, but in the early days, uh, the kinds of things happening here were very interesting biotically. We had oops, the formation of a lot of interesting compounds that ultimately went into, uh, that, that, that underwent uh, interesting reactions to ultimately lead to the first organisms. So we can't really know at the moment, we don't yet know how life actually originated. Some of the first fossils uh, that indicate the earliest life forms look like they show up around 3.85 billion years ago. These are more chemical traces that have indications that they were caused by biological activity. And later on, you start to see some uh, microfossil uh, indicators as well, little, that looks like little strings of cells, uh, or even some cases, larger formations. But only so much is preserved. So some of the ways in which scientists do studies of origins of life are by trying to make chemical simulations of what you know, might actually occur. So they'll take some of the precursors, some of the molecules that are suggested to have been present on early Earth, and subject them to conditions that are thought to have been present there to see if how, what kinds of things happen. How could life have arisen? So we need to think of some of the requirements uh, that, that we need to generate life. I mean, first of all, there's a lot of inorganic material out there. We need to be able to make these compounds, these organic chemicals, the basic building blocks of life. Okay, that's one important thing. There needs to be a way to concentrate them and contain them so that they actually can react with each other. You need an energy source and a way to link them together to make them more complex, larger molecules, and in many cases like DNA in our cells, for example, to be able to use them as blueprints to encode information. And this is called polymerization, to make chains of them or for proteins. And uh, of course, there needs to be a mechanism for them to actually start to replicate, to make more copies of themselves. Recently, in the last few decades, and especially in the last decade, there have been some really exciting advances towards this. Several experiments have been done that show that we're getting close to actually probably making uh, good simulations of, of, of the emergence of life. So for example, uh, there is now some evidence that uh, 
that in the early Earth, some of the, the environments, some of the hot pools are near hydrothermal vents, like I showed before, conditions were right to produce some of the building blocks of life. They actually occur naturally under those conditions. They can be created. Uh, Stanley Miller and, uh, and uh, uh, Harold Urey back in the 50s had demonstrated that just with lightning and some of the right components, you can generate some of these hundreds of kinds of compounds. Uh, also, meteorites, amazingly enough, deliver some of these components. They are made in space. And sometimes they were delivered to Earth in these major impacts at the beginning. Uh, in fact, today, if we look at some sorts of meteorites, scientists have been able to extract from them uh, molecules that, when resuspended in solution, they form these naturally organizing kind of like bags, almost like vesicles that, that look like the membranes of cells. In fact, may have been one of the components that uh, formed some of these ways to concentrate or contain some of the, the basic building blocks. Uh, also, even more interestingly, some work has been done by people like David Deemer to show that when these uh, vesicles form multiple layers, uh, when they go through drying and wetting cycles, they not only incorporate some of the, the basic building blocks of life, like nucleotides of RNA, but they also are able to polymerize them, to make them into chains. So there's ways, and there's several other mechanisms that, that have been suggested for this, so we don't really know exactly which is the right one. But there are some plausible means to get that far. And others, such as uh, Jack uh, Shostak and, and various other collaborators, have shown that there are sequences of ribonucleic acid, RNA, which is a messenger RNA or a messenger molecule in our cells, that can actually catalyze their own replication. And so we're starting to get bits of, of uh, biochemistry that can reproduce and also start to undergo natural selection, very close to the beginnings of a life in some ways. Okay, so that's, that's the very beginning. Ultimately, we don't know exactly how this happened, but cells were formed. Uh, it could have been one or several different kinds of processes happening. The very first cells probably had quite simple ways to take in materials, metabolize them or modify them, and use the energy that they drove, derived from them. Uh, ultimately, it became more complex. One of the interesting things that we see is these early cells if we take modern bacteria and other types of microbes, there are three domains of life that we know today. Bacteria, our eukaryota, which include us, with our complex uh, cells containing internal uh, organelles, and archaea, which is another branch that look like bacteria but are relatively unrelated. If we were to sequence the DNA of these organisms and arrange them according to how they likely evolve from each other, we find that those organisms that are most similar to the hypothetical sort of common ancestor that looked like the oldest things were thermophilic, at least they are today. Aquifex, Thermotoga, Pyridictium, Thermoproteus. These organisms live in really hot environments, often near hydrothermal vents, which suggests, uh, it's not for sure, but it suggests that the earliest life may also have been thermophilic. And that makes sense, right? Because around 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago, right near where life was beginning, was at the end of a massive amount of uh, asteroid impacts on Earth. The surface was, was really hot in some cases. So it may have actually acted as a filter on early life. And one of the, and as life became more complex, the ways in which it dealt with the material it used for energy became more complex. One of the themes that we see basically in all of life is the way in which it um, derives energy. In many cases, we have these reactions between molecules called oxidation reduction reactions. And so if you have some atoms, by way of their shape, the distance of their electron shells, have a tendency to give up electrons easily. And other types, because of their shape, have a hunger or thirst, effectively, for electrons. When you bring them close together, in many cases, these will form, these will undergo naturally a reaction where they transfer electrons from the donor to the, uh, to the recipient and this is a reduction oxidation reaction. And energy is often released in these reactions. Life typically uses these reactions and couples them uh, in a useful way. So you take, for example, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, it gets oxidized by loss of electrons to, say, sulfur, for example. This is one pathway. Those electrons and the energy um, can be used to reduce uh, carbon dioxide to organic carbon. And this is useful because 
whereas uh, carbon dioxide is not very useful to an organism uh, for food, organic carbon is. It has a lot of energy in its bond. So if you can use chemistry to effectively charge up carbon dioxide to something more useful, this is called autotrophy. Auto from self, trophy, feeding organisms that feed themselves by producing their own organic carbon. Okay, and this is what ultimately developed. What, and we see this early in the fossil record, the chemical signature um, by studying isotopes or different weights of certain atoms of organisms that probably utilized this autotrophic type of metabolism by making their own food up to over three billion years ago. It was pretty early on. How did they get energy to do this? Well, part of it, in some of them, came from the actual energy found in these reactions. It's chemoautotrophs. They used chemicals for energy. Another form used an abundant form of energy around uh, at the surface of the Earth, which uh, came in the form of sunlight, of course. Now, keeping in mind that there was also a lot of UV, this is a little bit complicated, but the, the, the major, one of the major forms of gaining energy is phototrophy. Again, photo from light, uh, trophy feeding, so organisms that feed on light or use light as a source of energy. This, is, this looks complicated, but really it's actually kind of simple. I'll, I'll break it down here. This is an example of a living uh, cell, a painting of it, of, of one of the earliest, of a descendant of one of the earliest kinds of photosynthetic or phototrophic organisms. It's a purple sulfur bacteria. It's purple because it contains partly uh, different kinds of pigments that interact with light. One of them is called bacteriochlorophyll. It's a key pigment. Pigments are compounds that, that absorb light pretty strongly, and they do that for a, a particular purpose that the cell uses them for. In this case, uh, bacteriochlorophyll, which is found on the membranes of this cell. If you magnify it, you'll find that there are these crazy protein complexes embedded in the membrane. This is the membrane cross-section here. And inside of these protein complexes, you have these pigments embedded in a particular way. This is a ring of uh, the carbon molecule, or carbon atoms are at these apexes, or the corners of, of some of these, uh, this, this di diagram here. And the way it's put together with this alternating single and double bonds, and in a ring shape with a magnesium uh, atom at the center, it's really useful because it has a lot of loose electrons that when light strikes it, those electrons can be kicked loose and given a lot of energy. Those free, kicked loose energy, uh, high energy electrons can be used by the cell to do work. And just really simply, like photosynthesis is, is, is kind of a complex, uh, um, process or phototrophy, not just photosynthesis, but th it's actually quite simple when you look at it, and I'll break it down here. The answer is that th the way this functions in some of these earlier or remnants of early microbes that use phototrophy is a pump connected to a generator, and that's it. So when light strikes, oh, here we go. So that's the, that's the photosynthetic reaction center I showed before, right? That's this here. Okay, it's got pigment molecules in it. Okay. There's a sort of conveyor belt of these shuttle compounds that take electrons that are freed, and they move them between components that act as partially as a pump. And here's how it works. Light hits the photosynthetic reaction center. And where there's pigments in here with those loose electrons, the light energizes those electrons and uh, sets them going on this path they're shuffled from one molecule to the other by the cell to do work. Okay, so there's a free electron kicked loose. It's shuttled uh, through, I'm, I'm missing a lot of pieces here for, for um, straightforwardness, but, but basically it's shuttled in this circuit. This is cyclic um, electron uh, transfer. Okay, so there's a reason for this. Have you ever gone to a mall and seen those crazy complex, uh, Constructions where you have like a ball that ro you know rolls through these these various things and, and causes funny sounds that hits bells and so on. Like here's an example. It's called a Rube Gold Goldberg machine, right? So you could have like water. It's a way of transferring energy from one form into another. Water falling hits this water wheel, uh, which has hammers that uh, you know that can hit this 
fulcrum, this uh, lever, cause a ball to fly up, go down this spiral pathway, hitting a little panel here that causes a saw to, over time, saw through this uh, rope and drop the bag of potatoes on the computer that's been minimal malfunctioning, giving you the blue screen of death. So it's a great way of getting rid of rid of a, a nasty computer without falling, throwing it in the water in the first place. So it's a way of transforming energy from one form into another, and that's basically what cells do. Um, they take light energy, which on its own isn't useful. It, 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 it can move molecules around, but you need it to be able to do work in the cell. And so what ends up happening is that these electrons, the movement of the electrons is coupled, is used, the energy is, driven, is, is drawn off it by a kind of a pump system. This is a cross-section of that membrane in which the, the various components are stuck. It's kind of a fluid membrane. It bounces around a bit. Um, but protons, which are basically hydrogen atoms without their electron, they're in solution inside the cell here. They can't cross through this cell membrane, but they can be pumped out using energy from the light that's been harvested through this energized electron. They're pumped out into this other space. Over time, as this keeps going, more light hits it, more protons are pumped out. They're stuck out there. They can't get back across the membrane. But this is useful because it generates a kind of an imbalance in concentration. There's kind of a pressure that develops. And they would normally try to flow back down. Well, try. Um, they, they tend to want to flow back down if we're putting sort of anthropomorphic uh, uh, tendencies to them. Uh, they would flow down, but there's no way, except that the cell opens up a possibility here. This was a major, uh, really neat component that evolved as well early on in life. This is, a kind, this is called an ATP synthase. It's a generator. When hydrogen atoms flow through it, it's not exactly accurate here, but it's a schematic diagram. They flow through it. This end here is, has a rotor of several parts. And as they flow through it, they turn the rotor. The rotor attracts uh, molecules of adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, and links them up with phosphate that's present also in the cell. And in doing so, it effectively recharges this common battery type of molecule that's used in cells. Adenosine triphosphate is produced. So basically what you have is these light energies used to pump hydrogen ions out. They fall back in because of the pressure from out here where they're accumulated. And as they do so, they recharge the cell's batteries effectively. And that's how phototrophy basically works. Th that photosynthetic um, reaction center I talked about before, where light strikes and hits the pigments, is actually not found by itself. It's really neat. It's part of this giant antenna complex. It's much bigger than this, even. This is the membrane. It's composed of a bunch of little uh, uh, phospholipid uh, molecules that are stuck together in sort of a semi-fluid way. This is all embedded in that membrane. Light strikes this complex, and it's like a solar collector or a bunch of solar cells put together. They can collect energy from a much wider area than only you know, light striking that one little central reaction center. Light strikes it. Energy is passed in what are called like cytons, uh, kind of an uh, excited state, from one to the other of these light harvesting complexes uh, units to the reaction center, and you get a larger area that's being uh, used for harvesting energy. Why is this important? Well, remember early on in, in, in uh, the Earth's history, I mentioned that there was uh, really nasty conditions. One of them is there was no ozone in the atmosphere, effectively. Now, ozone is useful because it's a sunblock, right? Without the sunblock, harmful ultraviolet radiation comes in, and organisms living at the surface would be fried by this UV and would undergo lots of mutation and overall have a very bad day. One of the ways in which life could survive near the surface, uh, once continents were around, is by growing inside of the spaces between rocks near the surface. That would allow it to the rock's surface parts to absorb some of the UV uh, and keep the organisms from getting damaged by it. But down there, there's less light, right? So having a larger area to harvest light is useful for that. In fact, if you look at modern day uh, microbial communities, if you take a cross section, this is actually a Winogradsky column, it's kind of a neat way to grow photosynthetic microorganisms. Uh, some of these early, or remnants of early phototrophs, these purple sulfur bacteria, typically take up residence somewhere underneath the surface for various reasons. But they inhabit an area where light is less uh, bright, and in fact, only a portion of it gets through. 
because some of it is absorbed from the parts above. And there's a really kind of a neat thing that happens here. If you look at a spectrum of, of radiation, let's say all the way from UV to infrared, remember that light waves, if we think of them as waves, it's a dual particle wave nature, but we can think of them as having wavelengths uh, of different sizes, and, and this is inverse to the amount of energy they have. UV with high energy has short wavelengths of 300 nanometers. Infrared starts from about 700, and visible light inhabits this area of 4 to 700 nanometers in length. When you shine light through one of these uh, bacteria that have the pigments, the pigments absorb some of the light. We can plot how much of the light of different wavelengths they absorb, right? So, for example, here you can see this is the plot that we get from shining light through a bacterial chlorophyll containing cell. It absorbs some UV, uh, some in the visible spectrum, but a whole thwack load of it here in the infrared. Okay? So for some reason, it's uh, absorbing a lot of infrared. Part of the usefulness of that is that infrared is some of the part that is not absorbed by the upper layers in these communities. But uh, let's step back to another interesting location here. Uh, this is some of the, the, the more fascinating parts of the research that, that I was involved in, actually. That I really enjoyed this part. Down in the deep ocean where you have these hydrothermal vents, remember this is where water seeping into the crust gets close to magma, is superheated, and then comes out through these fissures, forming these chimney-like structures as some of the metal sulfide precipitates out. It's super hot in many cases, up to over 400 degrees Celsius. It remains liquid because of the pressure down there. But what's really neat is that if you look at this through an infrared camera, you find that it glows. It makes sense, right? Partly it's black body radiation. Anything you heat up enough, like a stove top, glows red and becomes brighter and bluer the hotter it gets. At that temperature, it glows in the infrared. There may be other reasons for the glow as well, but that's simplified. Now, it turns out if you look at this plot of what radiation they preferentially absorb, this bacterial chlorophyll, and you plot also the emission of light or infrared from the black smoker chimney orifices, you find there's quite a lot of overlap between the emitted light uh, and how much of the light is in the infrared and the amount that's absorbed by bacteria chlorophyll. In fact, this has led some people to suggest that phototrophy may actually have uh, evolved first at hydrothermal vents and used geothermally generated light rather than sunlight. It's a possibility. There's no way to tell for sure because we can't really actually go and sample some of those original organisms. But one way to check is to say, well, is there anything like that out there today? Well, actually, uh, my PhD advisor, Dr. Vladimir Yurkov, was the first to isolate whoops, uh, bacteria that have bacteria chlorophyll. See, this is, it's been isolated from the bacteria. And here you can see that same kind of a plot uh, in terms of wavelength and how much of it is absorbed. And they live, they were isolated from the sort of the cloud or plume of particles of metal sulfides from around these chimneys. And what on earth are these guys doing down there with some, with uh, photosynthetic apparatus? And they actually have an active, it, it, it can actually work to some extent. Uh, these guys are actually mostly relying on existing sugars and, or well, chemicals carbon compounds out there that are reduced. So mostly they're not actually using photosynthesis, though they might be using it for something. Later on, actually, even in some ways more excitingly, another type of bacterium was isolated from near these vents as well. This also has bacteria chlorophyll and a functional um, uh, you know, photosynthetic system. And it's neat because it's an obligate phototroph. It it relies only on photosynthesis uh, uh, to, to make its food, basically. It doesn't uh, just survive by you know, eating, consuming other ready-made carbon around it. So that suggests that it actually maybe is using the light from the black smokers uh, to survive down there. So there is a possibility that that's actually where it originated. Don't know for sure, but fascinating systems anyway. This is a green sulfur bacterium, uh, incidentally. It's different from the other one, the previous one. Uh, it's kind of a painting of it. It's this bright, beautiful yellow color. I worked with this organism, and it's really got beautiful cultures. Citron yellow, basically, hence the name, citromicrobium. That's due to carotenoids, mainly, another group of pigments that are used for other purposes. But that's another story. Okay, so that was 
you can tell that photosynthesis and phototrophy in general was a very different kind of a thing early on in life. Whole different group of organisms. Many people don't know that there are actually about 10 or more types, major groups of phototrophic organisms out there, not just green plants and green algae and so on. Um, but at some point in time, probably about, mm, about 3 billion maybe years ago or something close to that, another group evolved. These are the oxygenic phototrophs. Okay, the previous ones were anoxygenic. I didn't mention that before because it's relevant now, and I'll explain why. There was a, a, an evolution of the pigment. Remember, it was bacteria chlorophyll. It was actually a bright blue pigment before. Then chlorophyll evolved. This is what gives plants and algae their green color. The molecule looks a little bit different, but it changes the way in which it absorbs light pretty substantially. And that's partly why it's green in color. What that did was allow the organism to better use the visible light spectrum. And there's a lot more energy in the visible light coming in than from the infrared, which means it could do more with this energy, and particularly what's called water splitting. This looks complicated, but there's a simple take-home message from it. This is the sort of the photosynthetic apparatus of something like a cyanobacterium or like a plant, for example, also has similar stuff. It's a little bit different in that it has two different kinds of uh, photosynthetic uh, uh, reaction centers and complexes. One of the big differences here is that although, although it also functions on the basis of pumping uh, hydrogen ions across a membrane, causing a, a buildup in the gradient here and then using the ATP synthase generator to create you know, recharged adenosine triphosphate from adenosine diphosphate and phosphate. That remember the cell's battery molecules? The difference here is that the high energy that it can actually utilize using chlorophyll allows it to split water uh, molecules into their components of oxygen and hydrogen. And the hydrogen can be used in generating this gradient that it uses then to generate energy for its own survival. And then one of the waste products, of course, of that is oxygen. Uh, this is called oxygenic photosynthesis because oxygen and then genic refers to the generation of it, sort of, so oxygen generating, it's a byproduct. The previous stuff was anoxygenic. They didn't split water, those earlier phototrophs. They relied on other means to gain what's called reducing power or the ability to, uh, to reduce carbon from carbon dioxide to more complex forms. These guys could use the extra energy also to make more what are called reducing equivalents, uh, ways in which the cell can then apply these high energy compounds to convert carbon dioxide into uh, organic carbon. So now it's a much more powerful system uh, for the cell, more efficient, and these guys took over very quickly. Well, took over, it took a while, yes, but you start to see them in the fossil record you see evidence of them in various forms, including uh, stromatolites. And stromatolites are still around today. There are these neat little stool-like uh, uh, formations. And this is in Shark Bay in Australia, for example. Uh, and basically what it is, it's a community of microorganisms, uh, cyanobacteria mainly, that form kind of a sheet on the surface of sand. And then through the action of waves, uh, there's sediment that's deposited on top of them. Suddenly it's like, uh oh, there's not much light. We've got to move to the surface. They grow to the surface. They form another layer, and then more sand gets deposited on them. It's a difficult life, but they keep growing. And as they do so, they make these laminations or layers of you know, organic matter, sand, organic matter, sand, and so on. And as they do so that, they grow upward and form these mounts. So th we find a lot of these in the fossil record, these stromatolites. And uh, it's one of the indicators of ancient life in these kinds of microbial communities. This happened uh, a lot once they evolved. We see stromatolites from possibly other organisms may have made them as well. It's a general thing, but a lot of them are cyanobacterial, probably. And what ended up happening once this new type of photosynthesis evolved and these guys started taking over, is this massive amount of oxygen was being released into the atmosphere or into the Earth's environment. They were terraforming the Earth, basically. They were changing the very nature of the planet, the surface of the planet. One of the first things that happened is that before that, there was a lot of, say, uh, dissolved iron floating in the oceans, 
when oxygen started to be released, this iron reacted with it and started to precipitate out of solution and formed these banded iron formations which show up at many uh, sites geologically. You have iron that, that rains out of the ocean and then it, the rate changes over time due to either seasonality or, or excess of oxygen, maybe pulses, and you get this banding that happens over time. And so you see some of these kind of things. There was a lot of that happening suddenly around 2.4 or so billion years ago when oxygen really started to take off. If you look over time from billions of years ago from today, one, two, three, four billion years about here, it's around this stage, around 2.4-ish billion years ago, that this great oxygenation event uh, took place after there were sufficient cyanobacteria around to really pump a lot of oxygen into the atmosphere. And the levels in the atmosphere started to increase once uh, this, this uh, amount of uh, uh, oxygen that was being used up by, say, for example, the iron in the oceans was overwhelmed. It just kept pumping out more and more. So eventually the atmosphere started to get higher oxygen concentrations. That changed the atmosphere massively. Uh, it, it happened in, in you know, several stages, but overall it increased from a tiny, tiny trace amount to initially at least uh, up to about five or so percent and then it kept rising. Of course, that was catastrophic to most life on Earth. Before then, uh, oxygen was not around much. They didn't have to deal with it. And oxygen is one of those things that we find useful because we breathe it. It's great as a way to dispose of excess electrons, but it also causes a lot of damage. It tears uh, biomolecules, uh, electrons away very easily, and it damages things like DNA and various other components. And so ultimately organisms had to evolve ways to deal with this potential damage. That's actually how aerobic respiration probably got started. It's sort of a byproduct of dealing with this toxin. Uh, but initially, it was a cat catastrophe. Ultimately, life evolved a way to use it. However, it wasn't all bad. One of the other uh, results of pumping all of this uh, waste oxygen into the atmosphere is that some of it drifted into the upper atmosphere and reacted with the ultraviolet light to form ozone. And our ozone layer gradually built up. And of course, that's nice to us because it eliminates one of the major forms of cellular damage, which is high energy ultraviolet light from space. There was another effect, this is a little bit more disputed, but there was another probable effect of all of this oxygen. It reacted with really good greenhouse gas, for example, methane. Uh, and when it did that, chances are it would have caused a decrease in the Earth's overall temperature. It's basically reduced the greenhouse effect caused by that molecule, methane, which is now kind of a, getting to be more of a problem. In doing that, uh, it may have triggered the first of a series of events called Snowball Earth, which is a crazy runaway glaciation that is known from the fossil record, it's, it's inferred from the fossil record at several points in Earth's history, where it looks like either the entire Earth or at least a very large proportion of it was covered in, in ice. Uh, it froze over largely and became uh, even more inhospitable, but in a different way. Uh, there's a very large amount of it that occurred around 2.1 to 2.4 billion years ago and very likely may have been caused by, at least in, indirectly by the great oxygenation event. Um, and uh, then there were a couple of other episodes for maybe other reasons. But it could be that this is what was caused initially by this, this cooling, potentially caused by the using up of greenhouse gases. Of course, that caused a whole other kind of extreme environment for life to deal with. And, and how did life actually survive that? And this is kind of the last point I'm going to talk about here, is that we've de dealt with hot environments. Those are also kind of acidic. Now we're dealing with cold environments, especially. The Earth would have been covered over by ice, largely. And some of this is known from looking at uh, paleomagnetic data, some of the areas where there were glacial deposits show that based on the, 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 the magnetism that's been recorded in the rocks from that time, it may have occurred around the, the equator of the Earth or near it. So it would suggest that ice was present over a large part of the Earth. Well, today we still have very interesting communities of, of microorganisms in these crazy cold places. If you go to Antarctica, and you look at those parts that aren't completely covered in ice, there are these dry valleys that have lakes on them that are permanently covered in ice. And sometimes over two, you know, like quite uh, hugely thick ice, anywhere from just, you know, a few tens of meters to, in some cases, over a kilometer of ice. Um, 
in, in the case of the, uh, the center of this ice sheet, it's you know, over two kilometers thick. Un if you look under Antarctica's ice sheet, there are several regions that likely have these permanent lakes or these lakes that exist under the ice. Uh, and there are life forms living there. Lake Vostok is one that we've heard about a lot, and it's a good example. They've been drilling down and finding interesting ancient life forms from near the surface of this and from other lakes that have been separated from the rest of the biosphere for sometimes millions of years. And they have evolved independently under those conditions. And these organisms are called uh, psychrophiles. They, uh, psychro is referring to cold and philes, you know, loving, so they're cold lovers. They require cold. If you brought them up to the temperature uh, that you know, we live at at our upper level, they wouldn't survive well because their cellular components are evolved to take advantage of that kind of condition better. Their lipids, for example, are evolved to be more fluid, so they don't go like butter under cold conditions, and, and other kinds of uh, things as well. So down here, for example, is a neat example of such a community. In these, uh, this corner of Antarctica here, there's an area at the base of the Taylor Glacier uh, that underneath it, there's a lake that empties into Lake Bonnie. And where it empties, one of the, the exits is this blood reddish colored deposits coming out of the ice, and it's called Blood Falls. It was noticed in the early part of the uh, 20th century. And what ends up happening is there's this glacial or subglacial lake that's been separated for a long time, but it's got microorganisms in it that have been growing there uh, independently, mostly, of the outside for a while. And they actually, you know, they, they have kind of a neat little a system there where, where some of the, the compounds that, that are used by one organism, uh, the waste products are used by a different organism. And they're these hypothesized to be these consortia, is what they're called, sort of teams of bacteria that use each other's waste products, uh, some of the waste products, and have a mini ecosystem there. Uh, there's iron that probably comes from the bedrock, and that's incorporated into the metabolism of these strange organisms. And then some of the runoff water contains a lot of the, the uh, oxidized iron that comes out as a result of this bacterial activity, um, as well as some of the cells, and that flows into Lake Bonnie. Uh, so these organisms live under these cold conditions, and it's hypothesized that this is one good example of, of a model of the types of ecosystems uh, that may have allowed life to survive some of these extreme cold and iced over conditions. And if you note, none of those uh, snowball earth types of episodes, if they're all brought, uh, uh, corroborated by research, occur at a time when there was uh, large life forms, metazoans, multicellular forms really present a lot. This was all microbial back then. So microorganisms would have had a much better chance of surviving than say, you know, fish or or mammals and so on. This, this was not, they weren't around at that point yet. Uh, and in fact, it was only after that and after the last of these major events that life in terms of animals took over and took off really crazily around the late Precambrian Cambrian, and the, the Cambrian explosion occurred. And after that, of course, you started to have the development of a lot of different kinds of larger life forms and, you know, dinosaurs came around and so on. And then uh, it became interesting from our point of view. But that's basically kind of a, some of the highlights of some of the interesting ways in which life took a foothold uh, and developed various kinds of strategies for surviving uh, on early Earth and, and originating. And hopefully some of the new research will show actually how that is most likely to have occurred. Um, and with that, actually, I'll leave you with this. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>